I wanted to look with you this evening, uh, a text out of Philippians. Now, Philippians, as you know, is a letter from the Apostle Paul to the church in the Roman colony of Philippi. I got to lean over here. I said, what are you doing to me, Bernard? It's like a workout. <laughs> I go, that, yeah, let me think I could do that, couldn't I? You know, I have kind of a one-track mind that runs in our family. But here you see, and the church there was founded during Paul's second missionary journey, probably in late 49, maybe in early 50. And you may recall that the missionaries that included Silas, Silas and Timothy and Luke, that they went there in response to the vision of the Macedonian man who was begging Paul to come and help them. And after they left Philippi, Paul received material assistance, funds, and help from the Philippians, both when he was in Thessalonica and when he was in Corinth. And Paul visited the Macedonian churches, which are those in Thessalonica and those in Philippi, on at least two occasions during the mid-50s. And Paul maintained a warm relationship with the Philippian congregation throughout his life. At the time of writing, Paul is in prison. He's probably in prison in Rome. So if that's correct, you can see Rome up here and you see Philippi over here. Now, if Rome, if that's indeed where he's in, in prison, then he's writing probably in A.D. 61 or 62. And this is near the end of Paul's first Roman imprisonment. And the Philippians... They had, they had sent Epaphroditus with a gift for Paul. So some funds or something to help Paul. And they had, they had given him instructions to care for Paul's need. But either when he was on the way there or after he got there, Epaphroditus became so ill that he almost died. And news of that grave illness had reached the brothers back in Philippi which caused great anxiety for them. And because it caused anxiety for them, it also caused anxiety for Epaphroditus. So when Epaphroditus, he recovered from that illness, Paul decided to send him back to the Philippians, and he takes that opportunity to send this letter to the church there in Philippi. Now in the opening, in the first 11 verses, Paul greets them, he tells them how thankful he is for them, and he shares his prayer for them. And then beginning in verse 12 of chapter 1, Paul says here, he turns his attention there to his current circumstance. And the first thing he does in that regard is he sets the record straight. He says in Philippians 1, 12 to 14, Now I want you to know, brothers that the things concerning me, some translations that have happened to me, have actually come about for the advancement of the gospel, so that my chains in the cause of Christ have become obvious throughout the whole palace guard and to all the rest. And most of the brothers have become confident in the Lord by my chains, are daring even more to speak the word fearlessly. Most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my chains, are daring even more to speak the word fearlessly. See, Paul is correcting some misunderstanding that the Philippians had gotten about his situation. See, contrary to what they'd been led to believe, when he says, now I want you to know. You see, they, they had gotten some other kind of impression, and he's setting that record straight. He wants them to know that his situation actually is a benefit for the cause of Christ, not a detriment. So they had, they had picked up this idea that somehow Paul's circumstance and situation was detrimental to the cause of Christ. He said, no, I want you to know that my situation and my circumstances have really gone the other way. Now, precisely what he means by his circumstances, that's not really clear. He may be referring simply to the fact of his imprisonment. You know, that when he, he appealed and he wound up 
being sent to Rome. He may be, be referring simply to that. But some think that he's referring to a more recent change in his circumstances while he's in prison. It's possible that his prison situation had changed quite recently because in A.D. 62, the infamous Tigellinus, he became head of the Praetorian Guard in place of the honest Burrus. And that's significant because until A.D. 63, Emperor Nero, he had delegated the handling of appeals to the Praetorian Guard. So you would have had a shift in 62, so it's possible this shift had happened. And if that's the case, Paul's circumstances may be his imprisonment as recently compounded by dimming prospects of his appeal, by having Tegelinus come in in place of birth. So maybe that's what he's referring to. But whatever the specifics, Paul wants the Philippians to know that God is in control and that Paul's circumstances in no way represent a defeat for God. He wants them to know that the gospel is advancing. And he wants them to know that because they share Paul's desire in that regard. And you have to just marvel. You have to marvel at God, how amazing it is. And how he accomplishes his purposes in the world in ways we do not expect. Right, the ultimate example of which is human redemption through divine crucifixion. Now that's a mind blower. In Acts chapter 23 verse 11, when the Lord told Paul, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. When he told him that, I doubt that Paul envisioned that he'd be doing that as a prisoner. And this ought to encourage us. You see, whenever we find ourselves in difficult situations, we need to look to see how can we serve and glorify God wherever we are and not go into a spiritual funk about our situation. God is looking for us to be faithful where we are, to be His instruments in our particular place. Whatever that place may be. I'm sure if I'm sitting in a jail in Rome, imprisoned, you're thinking about what in the world is God doing? He's calling you to be faithful and to be his instrument in that situation. And Paul understood that. And then Paul elaborates on the manner in which his circumstances have advanced the gospel. He gives some details about that. The whole palace guard. And everyone else involved in Paul's incarceration, they came to understand that he was in chains because of Christ. It became clear, no doubt through Paul's preaching, that he was in prison solely because of his conviction that Jesus is Lord. That was why he was in prison. He wasn't in prison, wasn't incarcerated because he was a criminal. They came to recognize that what was really behind Paul's imprisonment was his belief in the risen Lord. And the fact that he was willing to suffer, when that became clear to them, that the reason he's in prison is because of his belief in Jesus as the risen Lord, when they understood he was willing to suffer because of his allegiance to Christ, that's a powerful witness. That's a, he says... The gospel is advancing in my situation. How is it happening, Paul? Because all the people around me see that I am in chains because of my conviction of who Jesus is. And that preaches. When people come to see that you're willing to endure hardship, to suffer for allegiance to Christ. See, faith that is that deep, faith that is that genuine, that gets people's attention. Justin Martyr, a second century Christian, he wrote that as a pagan, he was greatly impressed with the courage of Christians in the face of death. Now Paul adds, he says, so how has the gospel advanced? It's advanced because all the people 
involved with and familiar with my incarceration have seen that what is, what is behind that is my commitment to Christ, so they recognize that I am suffering solely for my commitment to Christ. And he says that most of the brothers, they, they have been emboldened by my chains to preach the word even more fearlessly. You see, the fortitude of a leader in the face of unjust treatment often spurs those within the movement to greater zeal and courage. You consider the great witnesses we have in Hebrews 12, uh, 11.32 through 12.1. You know the great cloud of witnesses. And then it ends here with, Therefore, since we have such a, a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also, having laid aside every weight and easily entangling sin, run with endurance the race set before us. Well, why? It's because of these examples of people who lived crucified lives, sacrificial lives. Look at their example and draw courage from that. So Paul is saying that part of how the gospel is advanced through my circumstance is that the brothers are being encouraged to preach even more fearlessly. We saw that not too many years ago, this same phenomenon with Nelson Mandela's imprisonment in South Africa. You saw how it encouraged and strengthened people to stand. An entire freedom of a nation and people came out of that. So Paul, Paul is, he inspired the brothers by putting Christ above all else, even liberty and life. And this should tell us something about the potential influence of a sacrificially committed life. If we want to influence the world toward Christ and to encourage those around us to pursue Christ more zealously, we can't cave in on our obedience when it costs us something. You see, if as soon as Christianity becomes the least bit painful, we sell. We say, well, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't buy in for that. If as soon as it becomes the least bit painful, we surrender and yield our obedience, the world would, will conclude that our Lord is not worth very much. And you see Paul doing what he's doing. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry but others from goodwill. The ones do so out of love, knowing that I'm put here for a defense of the gospel. But the other ones proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not with a pure motive, expecting to stir up trouble by my chains. What does it matter? Only that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is is being proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Now Paul here, you see, he says that some of those who were stimulated, he said that my chains have stimulated the brothers to preach even more fearlessly. Now he says that some of those who were stimulated by his imprisonment to preach more fervently, they were doing so from mixed motives. He says they preached Christ out of envy, rivalry, and selfish ambition. They were competing with Paul in the presentation of the gospel. They were seeking to gain status at Paul's expense. They were trying to step on Paul to elevate themselves. Lower Paul so they stand up as taller poppies. And this is what they're doing. Now the phrase sometimes, like the NIV translate, that they're preached not sincerely. That's not good. Because it's really they preach not with pure motives. They sincerely believed the gospel message they were preaching, but part of their motive for preaching it was to elevate themselves above Paul. So they, believe, they were believers, they were Christians, they sincerely believed the message, but they were preaching it partly out of this selfish ambition where they want to uh, get over or, or hold themselves up higher than Paul. Now, by implication from verse 16, these competitive preachers, they didn't appreciate that Paul's imprisonment was a divine appointment in which he was faithfully discharging his ministry to the Gentiles. 
They didn't, they didn't grasp that. Instead, they saw it as a failure. They saw Paul's imprisonment as some kind of hindrance to the spread of the gospel. And judging from chapter 1, verse 12, that negative spin on Paul's imprisonment has apparently reached Philippi. That's why Paul felt the need to set the record straight. He says, I want you to know that my being here is served to advance the gospel contrary to this negative spin that the competitive preachers are trying to put on it so they can raise themselves above me. So he said that's, that's what's behind that. Now they suppose that they could stir up trouble for Paul by his chains. Now most translations say, while I am in chains. But in my judgment, it makes more sense to see Paul's imprisonment as the basis on which they were causing trouble. As Gerald Hawthorne, he's a New Testament guy, he translates it, they think they will stir up trouble because I am in prison. You see, this is what I think they're doing. They are using the fact of his imprisonment as an indication that he is out of favor with God. And then they were taking that and they are trying to step on him for that reason to elevate themselves above him. Now, D.A. Carson, he, he makes this comment. He says, one can easily imagine the reasoning of Paul's critics. Depending on how this case turns out, Paul's appeal to the emperor could bring Christianity into ill repute. Paul is constantly rushing headlong into things where a wiser, cooler head would have been cautious. Why did he have to go up to Jerusalem and get himself arrested anyway? He knew how much he was held in contempt there. Surely there was a better way. You see, can you see people saying that? Oh, I can. <laughs> I, can I can definitely see people making that kind of claim. Now, whoever these competitive preachers were, I think it's worth noting that they were not Judaizers. You see, Paul says that despite their impure motives, they preach Christ. Judging from Galatians chapter 1, Paul doesn't consider that the Judaizers preach the gospel at all. You know what Paul says there, if I or an angel haven't preached you a gospel other than the one, you know, let them be eternally condemned. So he sees the Judaizers, they're heretics. These people are preaching Christ, but they're doing so with mixed motives. Now we have to be very careful that our good works are not motivated by a desire to outshine somebody, by motivated by a kind of spiritual one-upmanship. And that problem, I think it's more acute among those that lead, those that preach, those that teach, where this uh, danger, I think, rears its head most readily. We can get into this kind of competitive thing with other teachers, preachers. Now, there are others who were encouraged by Paul's imprisonment to preach more fervently, more boldly. They were doing so out of goodwill and love. So you had the brothers are all energized. They are move to preach more fervently, but some of those who were moved that way are doing it out of mixed motives. But others are doing so out of goodwill and love, realizing that Paul was put there for the cause of the gospel. They see in this God's work. They are not trying to use his imprisonment against him and say, look at this, Paul's out of the will of God. Look, he's over here. He shouldn't have been doing that. They're not taking that tack. And Paul rejoiced in the preaching of the gospel, even if it was done as, at his expense. Now, that's pretty amazing to me. Even if it was done at his expense, he could swallow the small-mindedness of preachers who were intent on overshadowing him as long as they were driven by that competition to preach Christ to a dying world. Now, that's the heart of Paul. Let me read you another comment from D.A. Carson. He says, Paul's example is impressive and clear. Put the advance of the gospel at the center of your aspirations. Our own comfort, our bruised feelings, our reputations, our misunderstood motives, all of these are insignificant in comparison with the advance and splendor of the gospel. As Christians, we are called upon to put the advance of the gospel at the very center of of our aspirations. What are your aspirations? To make money, 
to get married, to travel, to see your grandchildren grow up, to find a new job, to retire early. None of these are inadmissible. None is to be despised. The question is whether these aspirations become so devouring that the Christian's central aspiration is squeezed to the periphery or choked out of existence entirely. And you see Paul's life. What Paul is focused on is the advance of the gospel so much so that at his expense, when people are dissing him in their preaching, that Paul can rejoice because Christ is in fact being preached. Now note, they were still preaching Christ. That doesn't mean that you have to rejoice over every heretic who happens to mention Jesus. Because heretics are always doing that, right? They don't come in and say, we have nothing to do with Christ. They come in and say, yeah, 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 we have the deep insight into Christ. So they were preaching Christ, and of course, in rejoicing over the result, Paul is in no way condoning the motives of such men. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, he makes clear that they are to do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty conceit. The how of the preaching is not the object of Paul's joy. The fact of the preaching is. That's what he's rejoicing over, is that Christ is being mentioned and being preached to a dying world. 118 to 21. He says, yes, and I will rejoice because I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this situation will turn out for salvation for me in keeping with my intense expectation and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but with all boldness now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether through life or through death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul says he will continue to rejoice in the future, regardless of the outcome of his impending trial, because he knows that the situation will turn out for his salvation. See, he's confident that nothing in his upcoming circumstances will jeopardize his salvation, that the road he's about to travel will not divert him from that goal. Now, the NIV and many other translations, they render the word here deliverance instead of salvation, presumably to suggest that Paul is referring to his release from prison. But the word is usually translated salvation. It's translated that way in this verse, in the King James, the English Revised, the American Standard, the New American Standard, the New English Translation, the NIV, all footnote salvation as an alternative translation. And in Paul, the word normally refers to the final deliverance of the believer at the last judgment. You say, well, okay, if, if that's the right take on it, then what's going on? See, this salvation that Paul, in my judgment, is talking about, this salvation will be in keeping with Paul's intense expectation and hope, he fully and confidently looked forward to the consummation, the return at Christ, being with Christ then, and entering into that ultimate eternal state. And we have to do the same thing. It's a source of joy. It's a rock. This hope that is ours is like none other. And it's interesting that the phrase, this will turn out for salvation for me, it's interesting that this is verbatim from the Greek text of Job chapter 13, verse 16. Now, I think that's interesting because I think Paul is probably applying to his situation the words of Job. So you know how Job here, Paul is like Job in the sense that Paul is confident of his vindication before God despite being held in contempt by others because of his hardships. What were, the, what were the friends doing to Job? They're looking at Job and saying, this is an indication that you're out of God's favor and that you are being punished or something like that. Paul is in prison. There are people trying to use that against him. And Paul sits here and he says, these things will turn out for my salvation. You see, he's confident of that. Paul is confident, you see, 
that of remaining saved through the upcoming trial. And that confidence is explained in terms of his confidence that he will in no way repudiate Christ. Well, what's the source of this confidence, Paul, that you have that you won't be diverted from salvation in this upcoming trial? And he says it's in terms of his confidence that he will in no way repudiate Christ. He knows the situation will turn out for his salvation because he knows he will in no way be ashamed, but with all boldness, now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body through life or through death. Whether it's death for me because I proclaim Jesus or whether it's release for me, I'm proclaiming Jesus. He will be exalted as always in my body. And so he says, I'm not going to be diverted. You know, Jesus taught that those who abandon him in persecution would be abandoned by him on that day. I could read you many scriptures where the Lord indicates that. And Paul had suffered greatly. Paul had suffered greatly. By the time of 2 Corinthians 11, he'd been repeatedly flogged, beaten with rods, and imprisoned. And he was once subjected to stoning. He was thereafter imprisoned in Jerusalem, imprisoned in Caesarea, and now he's imprisoned in Rome. And through all those times, despite being in constant danger, he maintained his confession, Jesus is Lord. That is the truth of the cosmos. Jesus is Lord. No shaking, no screaming, nothing can change that. And Paul held to that like a mad dog. Now the attitude or the perspective that helps create the will to suffer for Christ's sake, it is summarized in that statement for, to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. See, Paul could not be bullied by the threat of death because Paul knew to the core of his being that to die in Christ would be a blessing. Now, Paul was rightly confident, not arrogant. His confidence that he would not repudiate Christ, that he would maintain his perspective regardless of what happened to him, that was in turn based on his confidence in the power of their prayers on his behalf and the help given by the Spirit. Paul didn't boast that he would stand firm in his own power. That's not what he's doing. He trusted that God would grant him the strength in conjunction with their prayers on his behalf. And do you see how important it is? As brothers and sisters face trials and difficulties and are under the gun and are pressured, we need to pray for God to give them the strength to glorify Christ through their circumstance. And Paul says, I'm confident that God will work in my life. And I'll tell you, to me, this is something, because you think of the things that can happen to you in the world, and if you've read about the martyrs and the kinds of things that Christians have endured in this world, I just have to say, if, if Christ and the power of the Spirit doesn't help me, I'm doomed. You know, I, I just look at these things and they seem so frightening. And then I just say, God will grant me the power that I look at now and say, how can these people do this? How can they do it? And that's what Paul is saying. That by the power that he will give me the Spirit, I'm confident that now is always whether in life or death, I'm going to glorify you and be faithful. Now, confidence, almost through, I know you're glad, 122 to 26. But if I'm to live in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, yet what will I choose, I cannot tell. Indeed, I'm hard-pressed between the two. I have the desire to part and be with Christ, for this is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Being convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your advancement and joy in the faith so that your reason for glorying in Christ Jesus may overflow because of me through my coming again to you. Though dying, Paul recognized this, this would be a gain for him. 
He recognizes that, and though that's the case, he understands that if he is to go on living, it will mean fruitful labor, so he can't say which he would choose if it were up to him. If I had to pick, I can't say because I know it's going to be a blessing to be with you, but I know if I stay here, there's fruitful labor for me. So I can't pick between the two. He's torn. He desires to be with Christ, which is better by far, but he realizes his remaining alive is more necessary for the progress of the Philippians in their faith. And being convinced of the Philippians' spiritual need, and knowing God as he does, Paul is confident that he will in fact live on for the advancement and joy, their advancement and joy in the faith. Because he says, knowing this, that my being here is needed for you, and knowing God as I do, I'm confident that I will in fact see you again. That I will in fact live on. If it were up to him, he can't say which he would choose. But it's not up to him. And he's convinced that God will preserve him for the sake of his brethren. That God is going to do that and he will again visit them. So, we look at this. What I want to leave you. In conclusion, brother. In conclusion. I just want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, to remember in all the circumstances of your life, and as John and I always joke, this life's not turning out the way I planned. You see, life has all kinds of turns and things and situations and things that you wouldn't have thought of years ago, maybe not a week ago. But in all the situations and circumstances of your life, I want to encourage you, however dire those circumstances may be, that God can work through them to His glory, and that advancing the cause of Christ, whatever your situation, is to be your paramount concern as a Christian. That is first and foremost. That's front and center. How do I advance the cause of Christ? How do I glorify Jesus in this strange situation where I am? Even if it's a bummer, even if it's burdensome, what is my call in this situation to glorify Christ and advance the gospel? Because we may have been put there for such a time as that. For that we are there in that circumstance that is unique to us, that our light may shine right in that situation and circumstance. That we may carry that situation and circumstance in a way that people look around and they say, I don't know what's up with this person, but whatever they've got, I want some of it. You see, glorifying and carrying ourselves in all these situations. God will provide the strength, and ultimately, you and I will be with Him in glory, which is a blessing that far outweighs any present struggle and hardship that is the perspective those are the goggles through which we walk in this world that we have been redeemed and saved and rescued we are on the way to an eternity that is like none other and in that walk and process as we go you and I are dead set on glorifying God and advancing the gospel that is what we are about because we have been bought at a tremendous price if we can help you in any way, come forward.